um, my strength. So when when they came to me with uh, Diego Espinosa, I just about jumped out of my chair. Um, and and I will now what I will do for you. And this is why we call this a crypto Jewish primer. Is I'm going to take you through the thought process that I would normally do if somebody that I know very well would come to me and say, do you think that I could have a crypto Jewish background? I'm gonna walk you through that process, which uh, of course it's a lot more, uh, let's say uh, intense, but I'm, I'm giving you the overview because you do have to travel back hundreds and hundreds of years, but I'm gonna give you the overview of what I had to do to reach uh, some sort of end result on Diego de Finosa. And I also want to ask you um, in the questions, if you want to ask me questions about specific families and specific names, I'll be more than happy to answer you um, later. Like you can, uh, because it just kind of everyone else is not into, you know, we're really excited about our own families, but um, my website is geniemilgram.com. You can contact me via my website about your specific family. Um, if you're interested, um, but other than that, um, let's you know keep them a little bit more general for everyone's interest. And I'm going to share my presentation now, and we will go from here. Um, one second, we'll go from here. There is a. Hold on, one sec. Okay, here we go. I want to talk about how significant it is that we are having this talk today. So 529 years ago today, on March 31st, 1492, the Alhambra Decree, which came to be known as the Edict of Expulsion, was signed by Queen Isabella I of Castile and King Ferdinand II of Aragon, effectively eliminating all Jews from their combined kingdoms. That expulsion should have taken place where they actually had to leave on July 31st, but they really left on August 2nd of that same year. But what was not accounted for was that roughly one third or 100,000 of those, now I use this, people always ask how many Jews were in Spain at the time. And the reality is that nobody knows, but most historians conclude on 300,000 thousand Jews. What does that mean for us today? So uh, we will always use, I will always use the term of 300,000. Some historians write about a million, some write about 40,000, but everyone agrees on uh, just about 300,000. So 100,000 left and went to the Ottoman Empire. They became the Sephardic Jews as we know of them today. They melded very well with uh, the, the, the Muslim and the Arab culture. They have very rich foods, very rich way of, of praying, beautiful language and incredible customs. There was 100,000, the second 100,000 stayed and assimilated, went into Catholicism and virtually disappeared. And that roughly one third or 100,000 of those that stayed would pretend to be overtly Catholic and practice their Judaism underground, giving way to the phenomenon of crypto Jews and people like me who descend from them. I did return, I, I was born Roman Catholic. I returned to the Jewish people over 34 years ago and I have been a very uh, happy practicing um, Jew since then. So today we will attempt to follow a lineage that also seems to descend from those hidden Jews. I'm gonna to have to share this again because I've um, it got stuck. So let me do this again. I'm not quite sure why it's stuck, but um, let me see. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Okay. So how is crypto Jewish genealogy? How is it different from a regular genealogy? It is extremely different and you'll see why in a few minutes, it's like no other. Even for very seasoned genealogists, delving into crypto Jewish genealogy is that you have to totally turn around your mindset. For one, you have to forget all the family stories, 
the lores, the information that was passed down from all of the abuelas and make believe that you know nothing. This will help you, this, this amnesia will help you tremendously because it will allow you a free search into the past without getting stuck in a particular region or town. Families love all of these stories and stories and stories. But when you're doing crypto Jewish genealogy, you're kind of going under the story. So you have to forget the actual story. So remember, we're attempting to go down 500 plus years and look at the underbelly. So that's because the crypto Jews, that's what it means. Crypto means they're hidden. So they were doing the underbelly. They were hiding under society. So it's very clear that this is not Sephardic genealogy. Sephardic genealogy, when people talk about it, they're talking about the Jews that left Spain for the Ottoman Empire and Greece and all these other countries. We are talking about the Jews that stayed in Spain and hid their practices while pretending to be Catholic. This is about tracing the lineage of Catholics as they migrated from place to place while trying to find clues that they were Jewish. So we have to learn a little bit uh, when we do this. And, and again, this is a crypto Jewish genealogy primer. Primer number one is that you have to learn about the regions of ground zero. And all of these uh, regions that you see here, they kept changing, especially up and down this region here, up and down next to Spain, those uh, boundaries stayed in place because there's a river here, which made a natural boundary. But what changed above the river is sometimes this was a part of Spain, sometimes this was a part of Portugal. My family descended from right here, right on the river, and they went back and forth, back and forth from Spain to Portugal. So you should know in Spain, if you're researching 1492, you should take a look at what did the boundaries look like? What did the regions look like? If you're up to 1550, go look at it in 1550, 1650, 1750. That will change which way you are looking. So a lot of people ask about the sources. So many of the sources are located overseas. We're talking about physical books and libraries that are not on the internet absolutely not on the internet. Dissertations that are in books, in libraries, in obscure little towns all over Spain and Portugal. And lastly, Inquisition records. This last book to the right is actually the book of the Inquisition, there's volume one and two, in the Canary Islands. It's about 10, 10 inches high and it holds all of the genealogies of every single person that passed the Inquisition of the Canary Islands, all of these other things that are here, Judio Conversos in Castilla, the Jews of Provincia of Zamora, the village of my ancestors was in Zamora, and it is right behind me. I'm actually on the street uh, behind me where my 16th grandmother lived on the very last house uh, in 1545. So this is where we get our information. So a rule of thumb is to keep going west. And again, there will be many people and many families that will not fit this pattern, but most of, mostly if you start in the islands of Majorca, you would have gone to Spain. So I understand that people went east as well. They went uh, to Italy and many went to France. But as a rule of thumb, if you're looking for your family and you're a descendant and you're in the islands or you're in Mexico or you're in the United States, your family would have gone west. So as you research your family, um, it's good just keep moving west. So you will find sources and you will see the, the normal, and I don't like the word normal, but the typical diaspora, the, they went from Spain to Portugal, and then from Portugal directly to the New World, to Mexico, for example, or Spain to Portugal, Belgium, Holland, Netherlands, and Tilly's, and then down to the other islands and Mexico. So if you find many, many results for the name that you are looking for, and again, names changed at every generation, birth, uh, baptism, marriage, it was a different name. Um, when they died, it was a different name. So it really is a, a very tangled web, but of course can be done because I did it. Um, so you continue to start at the 
farthest east, continue west. Most likely, if you do it in that way, you'll be following their diaspora. Sometimes they stayed in the, in the Netherlands. Sometimes they stayed in London. An interesting note is that typical Sephardic lineages will have their diasporas going east to west. So if you were always Jewish and you know that your family left Spain in 1492 and you went on to uh, Turkey or, or Salonica, wherever you were going, you would then have been going east. So the crypto Jewish West and the typical uh, Sephardic East. So let's take note that the names change constantly. And I can't, I can't stress that enough because people say, oh, you know, my last name is Alvarez. Isn't that a Jewish name? That's why I didn't want to get into names in, in the questions. Um, like I said, I, I've had grandmothers that names change five, six, seven times. It's, it's, you really, first names never changed. And this is a great thing for investigation, but there were just not that many names. So right now, you know, they have the top 10 names when babies are born. You know, back then, it is literally a handful of 100, 150 maybe male names, 100, 150 female names. We're talking already, not Jewish names, we're talking the Christian names. So you're going to see the same names again and again and again. I mean, there are so many Catalinas on my tree that it's not even funny. I have had in a one generation in that speck of a village that my family came from, there have been 15 Catalinas to chase up. So again, it's a good thing, but also a challenge. So occupations, they rarely changed. A goldsmith or a weaver could continue his trade no matter what country he went to. He wasn't going to, all of a sudden, a goldsmith uh, is gonna be a shoemaker. It, it just didn't happen. All of a sudden, a generation and a half later, you'll see that his grandchild is now a goldsmith or a silversmith. So at many times when it became very challenging, I had followed first names. When it became double challenging, I was following their occupations, which doesn't help with the women because generally they are not mentioned as having work. Names are misspelled. Do not think for a second that Jimenez, 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 and Jimenez are not the same family. So a lot of people focus on, no, it can't be Jones because my Jones is with a J-H. No, 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 no. Here you can, and this is for all genealogy, not just crypto-Jewish. These names can be spelled any which way because a lot of people, they were just sounding them out, the scribes. They didn't really, there wasn't really names. There were family scribes. So. This brings us to E-S and E-Z. The last names were written with E-Z in Spain and with E-S in Portugal. Back to E-Z in the new world. There's no hidden meaning. This is the number one question that I get. Oh, I heard, learned, read that um, it, when it's E-S, it's Jewish. When it's E-Z, it's not, no. Um, so when they were to Portugal, all the names change to ES, Jewish or not. Um, I have listed the names of all the inquisitors when I have found them in the inquisition records. Do not be discouraged if you find that your relative was an inquisitor. Many crypto Jews became inquisitors to hide that they were Jews. There is no way to tell who was who unless you can follow them out of their original uh, location. And I say here, this is collection because I, I turned over my full collection to Jewish Gen uh, about two or three months ago. And it's something I had been working on for about 20 years, all bibliography, 55,000 plus entries of people and where the name came from and who their relatives were. It's, it's a massive work of genealogy in the Jewish Gen collection. Endogamy was rampant. Men marrying their nieces, first cousins marrying. This is a normal trait in crypto-Jewish families and in crypto-Jewish families as well. And in mine, every single generation had intermarried first cousins. And I, I put a lot of that on social media and my daughter is horrified. She literally calls me and says, mom, you don't need to be proud of this. I mean, 
that everybody married each other. Well, yeah, I, I, I am in a way because it, it's part of who we are. Um, you had to marry your family members, just like the Ashkenaz did in the Shtetls, uh, back in the day, they were marrying their cousins as well. I'm not saying they were marrying everybody, their first cousins, but they were marrying their cousins as well, just to be sure that they were marrying a Jew. And especially during the Inquisition, it was highly important that you marry a Jew. So that, that was happening, which brings us to Diego de Espinosa. And we'll go directly there. You'll follow the critical thinking that took place to reach our conclusion. So we start with questions so we understand where is the investigative challenge, where does it lie, and also the questions will lead us to how we'll research, research Diego. Every search will be very different given the geographical location. I was given a document uh, with some information that I organized into a tree, and here it is. Um, I was sent a document showing um, descendants, it had been typed up, and um, I had to organize it to be able to organize my thoughts. So this is just a, a little tiny miniature little tree on Excel that I did to be able to try to find Diego de Espinosa. So here were the questions that led to the research. Was he my personal ancestor? Was he crypto-Jewish when he lived, pretending to be Catholic? Did he maybe have a crypto Jewish ancestry, but no longer practice Judaism? What about those around him? What about the others on the tree? Could they have this special ancestry as well? What about the witnesses to certain events like marriages? I'll get back to that in a minute. Would they be crypto Jews? Witnesses and godparents were kept very close to family secrets. So if People back in the day, they, did, they weren't writing. Um, they had scribes, there were family scribes. The scribes each had a very typical signature. And I don't have a slide for that, but there are a lot of flourishes. Some look like swords. The scribe signature look like guns sometimes, just or flowers. It's very interesting, very flourishy signatures. And a scribe would work for a family from the time he started his practice, maybe in his late teens, until he was very elderly. So he knew when people changed their names. How did people change their names? How did they go about from generation to generation? The witness, and they were the witnesses. The witnesses and the godparents were holding the secrets tight. And we can see this more than anything if you ever have had an opportunity to look at the records of the Dutch Portuguese Jews, you can see that every single, just about every single witness was a very close family uh, relationship, which is why when I started, uh, okay, what are my questions to talk, let's find out about Diego, it's let's take a look at the surrounding people. So we'll start with number one. Was he my personal ancestor? Okay, um, I have 80, 90,000 people on my tree. I've done my tree from my dad's side, my mom's side, everybody's side. And you can see on this one, this is going every single line, which are really hundreds and thousands of lines. Every single line, this is me, my dad, my grandfather, great grandfather, ta ta ta. And you can see where we start with the de Espinosa. Um, Sigler de Espinosa, direct descendants of mine. And you can see them here on just about Juan Sigler. You can see Espinosa. Espinosa pops up again and again. Another one, Diego Sigler de Espinosa Porras. Those were actually had been left off on one of Columbus's ships in, um, I believe it was uh, the Dominican Republic, and and they tried to actually hijack the ship. So so there's a lot of history here. There's even more. So this is why. When I was sent the uh, Espinosa name, I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 what's going on here? So you can see in my tree all the way down, um, all the way down here, we're probably looking at the 17th generation. Um, and so every single line, and this is one of the reasons. So I started looking him up and my siglers, okay? These are my trees on ancestry.com. This isn't somebody else's tree. And I see that the main sigler that's my sigler 
was basically born in Cuba already. And uh, something on the document that was given to me, a family member had gone to Cuba, but in the 1600s. So my Espinosa was born in 1745. And you can see here, it uh, was later than the St. Augustine Espinosa. And he literally died in 1795, right before 1795. And I have all the documentation. So I was starting to, to feel that we're not talking about the same person, even though it might still be the same uh, family. So I mean. Got stuck again, sorry about that. Let me, I'm not exactly sure why that happens, but it does. So let's go back. Sorry about that. Um, and it's still stuck, so, uh, okay. Cindy, you can chime in and help me here anytime. Um, I'm not sure why your why your PowerPoint itself is is stuck. Are you sharing it as as the file or as the screen? As a screen. Maybe if you tried sharing it as the file specifically rather than the screen. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, sorry about that. So I continued with. I'm sorry. I continued with looking up at my tree. And this is my tree on ancestry. I continued looking up the Espinosas. I continued looking them all up where they were born, where you can see all of these Espinosas to the left that are on my tree. And at the end of this, and, and I'm really sorry, I'm just gonna have to share it from the, my apologies, I'm gonna have to share it from the, from here. And it might be smaller and I apologize about that, but we won't get stuck. Okay, I had to continue checking. I came to the conclusion that there might be a remote possibility of being my family member, but I'm not, I was not going to continue to chase up my own tree, be, even though Diego's name um, may be the same, everything that was happening around my Diego de Finosas and the Diego de Finosa I was given were totally different. And it's also very important to know that what makes a crypto Jewish name stronger and super strong um, as far as being um, a name that you know is solid is when it's a compound last name. My family was always Sigler Espinosa. I have been able to draw some conclusions on my Espinosa that um, there is a not so remote possibilities that the grandmother of Spinoza, the philosopher, and my 17th grandmother are the same person. But I never like to jump to conclusions or give any kind unless I have full documentation. Now the Sigler family, um, I know Sigler, my Sigler Espinoza family uh, lived in Cordoba, Spain. And the house that is called the house of the Juderia, the, which is a beautiful hotel, it's like a palacio in Cordoba belonged to my ancestor Juan Sigler Espinosa. So by the fact that it's a compound uh, last name, I pretty much um, moved on to the fact that um, we're not talking about the same person. So moving on, was he crypto Jewish? The obvious starting point is to search in the Mexican Inquisition files. Why? Because he was born in Mexico or he was living in Mexico. So then I went to the Mexican Inquisition files and you can see what they look like. I have uploaded all into Excel, now at Jewish Gen, all 2,900 entries of every person that passed the Inquisition in Mexico City, all their names, all their crimes, all their dates. And uh, this is what it looks like. And I was searching for the Espinosas there. So. Following through to my work, anyone that is in yellow from that whole tree that I showed you, I didn't find. However, I found Diego de Pinosa in 1631. Our Diego was born much later. So um, this Diego de Pinosa had unusual prayers, usually like in Hebrew. Um, another Isabel de Pinosa, she was killed for being a Jew. 
and another Simon de Pinoza was killed for being a Judaizer. And every single one of these people that are not in yellow were listed with the same exact names, some of the same dates, some in different dates, but all of these people on that tree in different dates, again, or same dates are definitely in the Mexican Inquisition files. I checked them one by one. I have everything there. So I wasn't going to go so deep with all of the relatives because I was focusing on our Diego de Pinoza. Okay, so in my database, I found all of the bibliographies with the Espinosa name. So we start, these are the bibliographies that I personally have gone through and uploaded. So we're looking at uh, Espinosa was in the Inquisition of Sevilla. He was in the Inquisition of Chile, Espinosa, the name, um, in Cartagena, Colombia. Judaizers in New Spain, I mean, on and on and on in the Carbajal uh, tree from the Book of the Martyr, on and on and on, you can see that the Espinosa name is definitely a name that sounds strongly as a Jewish uh, or crypto-Jewish, let's say, name that was used by people that were killed in the Inquisition, judged by the Inquisition, um, these are all highly, um, uh, these bibliographies that I'm showing you here, they are uh, very reliable ones. Uh, some are, all have been published and the rest come directly from the Inquisition records. So now we come to some answers. Was he my personal ancestor? I don't believe that he was. Was he crypto-Jewish when he lived pretending to be Catholic? We don't know this with certainty. Did he maybe have a crypto Jewish ancestry but no longer practice? This is more probable. What about those around him, the others on the tree? Could they also have this special ancestry as well? His relatives and ancestors, perhaps. And what about the witnesses to certain events like the marriages? Would they be crypto Jews? Witnesses and godparents were very kept very close. As I said, I do not see a relationship, but I do see a relationship with his relatives and his ancestors. This is something that uh, there's no denying it. This is something that we can see that the Espinosa name, not compound, because if it were compound, then we'd be having a problem here. That's why I took myself out of the equation because mine was always Siegler Espinosa. It was never Espinosa by itself. So even though I had a Diego, it, it's, it was too strong a Siegler Espinosa. So can we take this back and look at every single person in the Inquisition records and run their lineages all the way back to Spain and Portugal? Yes, we, we absolutely can do that. Um, is that something that um, I was going to do for this presentation. No, it really is a, a, a gargantuan work, could take several years, but I'm walking you now the next step. Let's surf the internet as if we don't know anything, as if we don't know anything about bibliographies, inquisition, and I decided to try these searches. Diego de Espinosa in a general Google search, Diego de Espinosa under Google Books, because Google Books are a treasure trove. I mean, I, I, people many times says, but I Googled him. I didn't find anything. Well, did you Google in books? Because that's where the real stuff happens. Searching and family search, which are the Mormons, and they do not per se have any Jewish records on the Mormon website. However, they are the masters of all the churches and they send volunteers out. My goodness, under special collections, out comes a map. You click on Santo Domingo, or you click on Peru, or you click on Portugal, whatever you want, you will get every church ever known, and you can find full lineages. I actually found my paternal grandmother just on family search in Costa Rica, where she was from, and I was able to take my paternal grandmother back to 16-something um, before they had come to Costa Rica from France. So really, this if you've never used it, I highly suggest that you check under special collections. 
um, searching on Ancestry.com because I know that they have a lot of Mexican records, um, searching in Genie.com. And I'm not a fan of Genie. I, I must tell you, a lot of people use Genie. They're trying to make a world uh, tree. I'm not a fan of Genie.com because they allow people, random strange people to come in and change your tree. So people like me who have a very documented primary source, full bibliography on, on 70,000 people, I don't want a random person to come in and change the name of one of my ancestors because they think it should be something different. So I absolutely stay away from genie.com. However, there is so much information in Genie because they do have that they want to create this world tree that it's always, for me at least, worth taking a look at genie.com and then taking the information with a grain of salt to be able to, later on, to be able to really check it out from a, a very, you know, very well checked out. And then searching in all the voyages to the new world. So that's what I decided to do next. Um, and that's where we're going with this. So general Google search. Oh no. Oh no, my first general Google search. I find that Cardinal Diego de Pinoza, 1502 to five, he was a cardinal and the Grand Inquisitor in Spain in 1566 to 1572. And this is what I said before, don't freak out if the first thing you find, because I went into this blind, because again, I was looking for somebody I'd never seen. I don't know the name of every inquisitor. And so to find the only thing in there about a Diego de Pinoza was that he was a grand inquisitor. It was like, oh, okay, you know, I get it. He could have been crypto Jewish. That was like, after my initial uh, freaking out happened, then I realized that, oh my gosh, he could have been crypto Jewish because he was an inquisitor, but not, I, there's not enough there, right? So Google books, Nothing of interest except all of the references to St. Augustine's uh, past history. So um, I wasn't able to, to get anything else from a general Google search. Simple internet searches. Familysearch.org did not yield important results. Could have been there was no marriage or birth registered for a free slave. And we'll go back to the free slave in a minute. Ancestry.com has a lot more information, but would have to be really combed through, like I said, um, to find additional family members and exact date matches. I think that if somebody were to pick up the work that I've done, Ancestry.com is an amazing, uh, has an amazing amount of information. Somebody could really follow it. Dini.com also did not have immediate matches, but would have to be poured over. And then the cat uh, Catalogo de Pasajeros of Indias would be a valuable resource. So what that is, and if anybody wants this because they're doing work, just ask me for it. I, I happen to have downloaded it. It is the ship's manifests of every single ship that left Spain from, I believe, 1502 to, I believe it was 1835. And it has every single family that left and who they left with. It doesn't many times say where they were going, but it'll say things like Jeannie Milgram and her husband, Michael, and their daughter, Nicole, sailed from Valladolid, um, uh, Jeannie Milgram was a genealogist, and it's just like a blurb. So some of the questions that remained are to find a link to Spain. I did find the Espinosa name in the Toledo Inquisition, but we cannot be certain without further research and a full uh, lineage uh, research on him. Um, so here's, if anybody wants, I, I email me via my website, uh, I can send you this whole catalog. It's nine volumes. It's very extensive. Um, you can find inside it by doing a simple control F find feature um, on a PDF document. And uh, however, it doesn't have any index. It doesn't have any kind of alphabetization. It's just like, whoa, you know, name after name after name, year after year, but it is one of the most valuable, many people are, are, are missing that link between, they take their family all the way back in Cuba or all the way back in Mexico or wherever it is in Jamaica, and then they're missing 
when the passenger got there and where they came from. This is actually the missing link. Okay, so I looked it up and I found, I looked exactly in, you can see it here. I found this, Diego de Espinosa. Um, they left from, uh, they were from Guadalcanal and the, the father was Francisco de Espinosa and Isabel Nunez. And I found several in this catalog of the ship's manifest. As you can see, it's just a number, thousands and thousands and thousands of people leaving on that date. So the conclusion is that there is a probability that Diego had Jewish ancestry. However, it does not seem that the family continued as practicing Jews. Why? Because he married a free slave. That, um, that is very telling. Crypto Jews that were going to continue as crypto Jews wanted more than anything to continue these lineages. That was like number one to continue the Jewish lineage to continue. Diego married a freed slave. She was dark. She was a dark freed slave. That is in the records that was given to me uh, when I started looking at this. So it seems to me that if he was continuing to practice he wouldn't have married a freed slave. And that is just what we know about our history. It, it just seemed that, that he wouldn't. So, and his relatives in Mexico may have continued as crypto Jews. As we see in the Inquisition records, um, he was not killed in the Mexican Inquisition, uh, but to know for sure whether he was a crypto Jew and maybe he was rebellious, maybe he fell in love with this woman, maybe it had nothing to do. And maybe he, you know, there's a lot of maybes here and I, I don't do well with maybes. I, you can see, I have given you a presentation of circumstantial evidence. And that is what we do when we study crypto Jewish lineages, then you have to go deeper into it. So um, you can always reach me via geniemilgram.com. My books are all on Amazon and on Facebook, I'm under Jeannie Milgram. My 15 grandmothers, prior to is my personal journey, uh, prior to fire, when I found all of this rich historical documentation on my own family, I wrote prior to fire as a fiction uh, work because obviously you know we weren't there with the history, but it's 85% how my family moved through uh, Spain and Portugal as crypto Jews, then the recipes of my 15 grandmothers. Uh, from recipes that I found in my house, in my mother's house. Many of them date back to the Inquisition. And uh, I wrote a book, How I Found My 15 Grandmothers, which is a step-by-step -step guide. So we will now go to questions. Huh. All right. Uh, again, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, we've all learned enough to have many more questions now than we did when we started. And that's, I say that as a compliment. Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself and we'll start with Megan Wall, uh, but you do need to unmute and you may ask a question. You may also, of course, ask by going into the chat. Either way, uh, we have different audiences with different uh, uh, skills in Zoom, but Megan Wall. What is your question? And please unmute yourself. Thank you. I didn't think I had a question, but I want to say thank you. That was fascinating. I'm sorry if I accidentally raised my hand. I cannot imagine your tenacity of wanting to find this heritage. It's just mind boggling. What thank inspired you. you to spend this much time when obviously you could do a lot of things with your time? What inspired you to want to do this per se? Megan, I... I was raised very strict Roman Catholic, and you'd have to have heard or, or seen or maybe read my book, My Personal History, but from a very, very, very young age, I felt a draw to, to Judaism. From within Catholic schools in the 60s, which there's enough jokes about that. So I, um, I felt drawn to, I felt I didn't belong. I felt drawn to the Jewish religion. And it, it was, I, I actually converted. It took me five and a half years to, uh, I was in an Orthodox conversion for five and a half years um, in my um, late twenties. 
I finally, you know, went ahead and did that. And it was only 10 years later when my grandmother died and she left me some uh, artifact that I realized that she had been teaching me Jewish, um, uh, Jewish traditions in the kitchen for years, part of what inspired the book. And then I decided to research just to kind of in the beginning, just to make sure I wasn't crazy. That hasn't been proven though. That's still one of the questions at the end, but just kind of to, for myself. And then later I was already a practicing Jew and very active in my community, but I started going back for other people to give them the hope, the candle to pass on that they too could get this done. Uh, other questions? Why don't you just yell out if you'd like? Hi. Hi, Jeannie. My Diane. name is Diane. Yes. yes. Hi. Oh. I live in Colorado. And one thing that drew me to this presentation is that my um, two times great grandpa was Espinosa. And have you um, linked any Espinosas to the Southwest, you know, like New Mexico or anything like that? You know, Diane, they, they must have come directly up from Mexico because mm -hmm. when we go into those Mexican Inquisition records, we can see the, the sheer amount of Espinosas that are in there. So I haven't personally done it because I, I only highlighted the Sigler de Espinosa portion from my dad. Um, but I am certain that if you go back and start looking into the Mexican Inquisition records, that is definitely where they came from because this, this family was, you know, from going into Mexico and up. I can okay. tell you, this is Charlene. I can right, tell Charlene. you as a person who is from the Southwest, I mean, my family is, that there are detailed records that you will, that are online that you can access Seth, really easily, there's, I mean, it's amazing how detailed they are. And you can easily how can uh, I, look for, to... uh, my family is Gallegos and Silva and Baca and Barreras. So it's, it's, it's easy to find in New Mexico and Southern Colorado. Absolutely. Hi. It yes, gets a little bit harder when you get over to Spain and Portugal. Um, yes. Thank you, Charlene. I do want to uh, address a uh, no, question that's in the chat, yeah. which is about DNA. So somebody asked in the chat about DNA and if I've done my DNA. <clears throat> Absolutely. So when I did my DNA the first time many years ago with Family Tree DNA, um, I found an exact match in Recife of Brazil. Now, of course, you know, the, the Portuguese portion of my family would have gone down to Brazil, but this fellow was an exact match. So we danced, I danced around the question a little bit of was he Catholic, was he not Catholic? And then he comes out and tells me that he had been raised Catholic and had returned to the Jewish people. And I'm going, oh my God, it's like my genetic my brother down in Recife. And then we start comparing family trees because he had done his family also to 20 generations and when we compared we couldn't find we couldn't find it didn't make sense we contacted the company they said it's 300 years apart. we were combing our trees and finally it came out that um our i think it was our 14th grandmother was caught her husband was caught by the inquisition in portugal and then she gave birth to all his family then when her husband was killed, she crossed the river, she forged the documents, we found the forged document. The last name was Herrera. She went to Spain and she forged it to be Herrera and gave birth to um, all my family. From that moment on, every woman on my tree was named Catalina and every woman on his tree was named Rosalina. So we're definitely talking about the same grandmother who just left this amazing legacy. When I did my mom's DNA, my mom ended up with 48% Sephardic and about 18% Ashkenaz. And my dad um, also, uh, I think it was about, I don't recall, maybe 20 something percent Ashkenaz. I don't know where the Ashkenaz came from because I know every relative intimately. 
I have no idea how they snuck in there. No idea. Uh, Jeannie, uh, Dr. Stanley Hortis uh, recently discovered someone who showed up in New Mexico who had passed through St. Augustine. Uh, in general, are the uh, crypto Jews of the Southeast isolated from the crypto Jews of the Southwest? Or have you ever discovered linkage between the two? And, and what avenues of exploration, therefore, are more fruitful than others? I have actually found them to be totally separate. The crypto Jews of the East were generally making stops over from Spain. They were very attached to the islands. They were attached to, to Cuba. They were attached to Puerto Rico. They were attached to the Dominican Republic. I personally have not seen a link between the Southwestern Jews and the Jews uh, and the crypto Jews of the East. Um, mostly what I have seen from the East is that they were navigators. They were, you know, you had the ocean factor. So they were navigating between islands. There was a lot of trade with the islands. They were coming from Suriname. They were going to Curaçao. They were going to another island. They were going to Cuba. They were touching Mexico, but all navigationally. And I've never seen um, a, a, let's say a correlation between the, the Southwestern Jews and the mm -hmm. Southeastern Jews. Thank you. We have a question from Karen Carmel uh, about naming protocols and using first names and using last names. And I suppose the issue of stability of last names. Would you speak about that, please? I will. Um, definitely, there are Sephardic naming patterns. And just like an Ashkenaz Jew would not name their child uh, your own name, the Sephardic naming pattern is, is very distinctive. Um, you, you have the, the name of the, the first grandparent, and then the next child has the name of, of the next uh, grandparent, and then it goes from the wife, and it goes to the husband. What happened, though, with the crypto Jews is that they were following that, but for the first names only, because the last names were changing so often. So it was very difficult. The names were random. I mean, they were sometimes taking family names as surnames, and, and many times not. So I saw them many times following the Sephardic naming pattern. Earlier on, it kind of stopped in 1700, more or less, but they were definitely doing the Sephardic naming pattern. Okay. Uh, Jeannie, oh, yeah, can I speak? Uh, Lo Lois, by all means. Yeah. So Smith. on the program, Children of the Inquisition, 500 years in which you were given credit, I was, looked for your name and you got it, and I'm so delighted. Um, it talked about Seattle having one of the largest Sephardic Jewish communities, and the people going up that way were, you know, victims of the Inquisition who originally settled in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, but some of those were people who, as you said, went from the, the Iberian Peninsula up to the Netherlands, and because of the sugar trade, went to Brazil. So that's right. how they ended up in Brazil and then moved north. But yeah, it was really interesting to see so many Hispanic looking, almost Indios that were claiming to be crypto Jews. And it was, I mean- It's actually, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, it was actually not just sugar, um, the crypto Jews, and obviously they, they were also the most famous in the tobacco, the coffee, and especially, they had their hands around the cocoa. The cocoa plantations, the tobacco plantations in Suriname, in the islands, in Recife, up and down Brazil, it was definitely the trade. That's why I talked about the, the navigation. It was definitely the trade, but they were definitely very large uh, plantation owners. Um, and I would have wanted to say about the fine line, is that when my collection went up on Jewish Gen, Jewish Gen was thrilled. They named it the Crypto, they named it the Jeannie Milgram Crypto Jewish Collection. Absolutely thrilled. Can somebody unmute? Yes, this is uh, Dr. Larry Cantor. I'm the one that discovered the name of uh, Don Diego. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, what I, uh, 
I hope I answered it somewhat for you. You did. You did. I was very pleased. Two things. One, the name Sigler. I mean, I knew some Siglers when I grew up and we all were Ashkenazim Jews. Uh, how did that was? Is that a particularly Sephardic name or not? You know, that that's what I was saying. And I'm glad you brought that up. Ooh. I have investigated Sigler where my husband has told me that I have already uh, built a summer home for my genealogist. Um, <laughs> I have been able to take and give, so my great grandmother from my dad's side, she was Sigler Espinosa and uh, her name was Nicolasa Sigler. So I took the Siglers all the way back to 1508 where um, Meryl, could you ask them to, uh, to mute them? Yeah, I'm looking for who that is and I'm having problems looking at them. That, that's actually Dr. Cantor, if you could mute. Uh, okay. Okay. Mute? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I was able to find the first Sigler to be in 1508 in, um, and, and fighting, they were all soldiers. These Siglers were all soldiers and they were fighting in a war against Ireland. But the Sigler that owned the house in Cordoba, because I tried to tie in this Ashkenaz DNA that was coming out of nowhere, um, I finally found that my Sigler was the page to Leopold III when he lived in Spain. And there's something historically written that he had slept with a German woman. My idea is that he slept with a German Jewish woman. And this is how the DNA came. And because there's like no origins on that particular Huang Sigler. So I do not think that Sigler, to, in a roundabout way, go back to your question. Um, I do not believe that that Sigler is a Sephardic name. I believe that all that Ashkenaz that's showing up in my own DNA is coming from uh, Sigler and that the Siglers are probably coming either from Austria or were mixed up in this thing with uh, this German Jewish, uh, this German woman. All right. Uh, other questions? Uh, Jeannie, if I may, we are entering the period of the counting of the Omer beginning with uh, Passover, counting 49 days, when uh, typically Jews do not marry. And of course, Catholics don't marry during Lent, the 40 days before Easter. Have you found any patterns of marriage dates amongst crypto Jews? And have you found any holes or vacancies during the Lent or during the Omer at all? Uh, no, certainly not during uh, the Omer, and I have studied this um, quite well. The girls were being, um, they were already signing to nine. They were being engaged at a very young age when they found that cousin. So they were already doing these like engagement things when they were 12 and 13 years old, and then marrying when they were 17. Um, they were marrying, uh, there were a lot of priests and nuns in our families so that we could keep the Jewish tradition. So they would like marry, now that you're talking about marriage, and I know that wasn't your question, but they would marry like the night before Jewishly, and then they would show up at the church and have this massive uh, church wedding. So all these priests and nuns in our families, um, people are like, oh my gosh, I'm going back and I'm finding all these priests and nuns, I'm getting so discouraged. I'm like, what are you kidding? That's like fantastic. The more priests, the more nuns, go for it. So um, I, did, I didn't think, to be honest with you, to, to extrapolate the, the marriage dates to see what they were with the Hebrew dates. Um, and so I, I wish I had done it as I was going along, but you're probably right. I wish I had done it. All right. All right. If, if I may tag, tag on to that real quickly. Um, uh, one of the things that, um, that I've seen, that I've been finding in my, in my research, and I'm so glad that you just mentioned what you did because it, it, it reassures me. Um, nearly every generation of crypto Jewish family that I've tracked back has a family priest. And that family priest did all the baptisms and the family priest did all the weddings and the family priest did all, all the burials. And so um, 
that's that's one of the the identifiers that I'm using in my own personal research. So I'm really glad that you said that because I was going to ask you if that is something that you had seen. Oh, as well. absolutely, Cindy. I have so many, and my mom was not happy when I did this. Right? It was like you know we're like this elite uh, Cuban Catholic family, and all of a sudden we're Jews. My mom was not a happy camper, but she kept telling me every there's so many priests and so many priests and so many nuns. We even have a saint. Well, yeah, but that's a good thing, right? And it's also a good thing. I, I, I never thought that I would be so happy to find that I had so many relatives that had gone to prison. But by the fact that they went to Inquisition prison made me be able to follow my own lineage. So I'm, you know, it's just kind of strange. You know, this is like the dark side of everything, but um, it's what helps us go back to who we really are. Yeah. Uh, if there are no further questions, allow me a moment to recognize first Corinne Brown, of course, who suggested that our organizations, the Society for Crypto Judaic Studies and the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society partner on presenting Jeannie Milgram and uh, with a number of side questions in the chat and elsewhere. Maybe we'll do it again soon, but do visit the, oh, and by the way, and Joe Levitt, Lovett, the uh, producer, director of the film, Jews of uh, Children of the Inquisition. Uh, if you haven't brought it to your community, I urge you to do so. Uh, all of you requested a link from a email address, S-A-J-H-S, 1565, that's St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society, 1565 at gmail.com. If you send an email again to that address, uh, I will be happy to put you in touch with uh, Joe Levitt. I will be happy to put you in touch with the people who take care of membership for the Society of Crypto Judaic Studies. I'll be happy to put you in touch with the people who take care of membership for the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. Uh, your interest is very important to us. Uh, uh, if you, I, I am sure you have all encountered Jews who say that if your ancestors didn't speak Yiddish, you're not really Jewish. And, and so those who have joined us this evening are, and I mean each of you, is a very select group and very important. They want to maintain contact. If you have questions about individual families, and I've seen that come up in chat, please go to JeannieMilgram.com and there's a contact form and ask her directly. Uh, you'll marvel at her knowledge, her encyclopedic mastery of uh, Jewish genealogy. Uh, do approach her. And if you have other questions, again, you can email us at SAJHS org and i thank you all for being here join can i say something real quick? Uh, please Jeannie, it's your yes. by all means. um i want to thank you all really for this opportunity because it's been a long time you got me honing my my you know my skills that i that were there uh dr larry Cantor, thank you for finding that um and robin and, and rabbi merrill shapiro thank you so so much everyone from the historical society and Cindy Seaton Rogers, Corinne Brown from the Society of Crypto Judaic Studies. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Uh, everyone have a good evening. Yes. Yeah, so you know what? If, if, the way we applaud is holding our hands in front of the camera and uh, expressing our gratitude. Uh, everyone, please be safe and wash your hands. And you have lots of <laughs> Site. If you need those websites, and there will be a recording available of this event, Cindy Seaton Rogers, again, president of the Society of Crypto Judaic Studies, took care of that. Uh, again, visit scjs.org if you'd like to join, uh, receive their journal and their bulletin, and the same with the uh, St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Jeannie and Cindy and everyone. Thank you.